Great. Thank you so much to M the MSMDS community, um, the organizers of the event for having us here. I appreciate it. And I have learned so much over the last two days. So thank you. Um, and I recognize that talking to this group of caregivers about coping with caregiving, it might be a little bit like you know, speaking to the choir. Um, you guys have as much to offer as I do probably. And I've certainly learned, um, I made a few notes in my papers yesterday because I learned from all of you. Um, so we are gonna switch from all these wonderful medical ex experts to talk a little bit about your experience as a caregiver, as a parent, as a grandparent, taking care of a child with MSMDS. So I am a social worker from the Notre Dame PD Pals program. It's a community-based palliative care program. You're gonna hear a little bit more about it from my coworkers in just a few minutes. Um, but I'm also what they call a double agent. So I'm a social worker and I'm a mom. My daughter the, at the top is Katie. He, that's an old picture. Yeah, she's like 32 now. <laughs> um, but I put it up there to let you know that, you know, I too have dealt with a child with complex medical conditions. Katie's been diagnosed with Rett syndrome. And I came here suspecting that some of the challenges we faced as a family are some of the challenges you face as a family. And that has sort of, certainly borne out over the last two days. Um, I've heard you talk about challenges with coordinating care, uh, finding time to deal with all of the medical uh, care needs during the day, uh, as well as your siblings and your parents and whoever else work probably in your life, you know, um, there are a lot of challenges. Anybody want to offer a few more? Are most of the doctors out of the room? No, there's a few left. Sometimes dealing with the doctors is even challenging, right? Let's be honest, or at least navigating the systems of care, right? The special ed services, the e, you know IEPs, um, the specialties, the primary care, getting all the medications in place, the supplies in place, DME for rehab, right? There's a lot to deal with. And I don't tell you this to overwhelm you. I tell you this because we're so good at compartmentalizing. We forget sometimes how much we're doing on a daily basis. And I want you to take time to consider your own needs. I'm not going to talk just about challenges and be depressing the whole time. We're also going to talk about the rewards and benefits for, for doing this work, for being a parent of a child with disabilities. And I really love this, this quote from another mom because it sums up both the challenges and the rewards. And she says, you are now in a secret world. You'll see things you never imagined. Ignorance, rudeness, discrimination. And I'll add, and you'll have all those challenges we just talked about, right? But you'll also witness so many everyday miracles and you'll know it. You won't think a milestone's just a milestone. You will know it's a miracle. You'll treasure things most people won't even think about. And you'll become an advocate, an educator, a specialist, a therapist, but most of all, you'll be a parent to most wonderful child. One of the major um, challenges we have as parents, which I've heard brought up in just the last few minutes, right? Having to forego, having to have your child forego playing baseball or rugby, something like that, right? That's a loss. And so much of what we face as parents, our emotional experience revolves around grief. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this. Hopefully older parents already know this, but I did wanna include it for those newer parents who may not have had anybody identify it as grief yet, right? We don't just experience grief when we lose somebody. We experience grief when we lose activities, opportunities, um, our time, our lifestyle, the plans we had for the future, right? The hopes and possibilities we had for our child, for our family. For ourselves, I know a lot of moms and dads who had to like cut back on work commitments or for, you know, totally abandon work because of the needs of their child. So grief is something that we need to talk a little bit about because it is so much about what our experience revolves, revolves around. 
So I've got a lot to say, so I am going to be quick. <laughs> but what is grief? It's an emotional, cognitive, physical, and spiritual response to loss. It's also a dynamic, ongoing, natural, spontaneous, self-sufficient healing process. Healing process. It may last longer. It may never go away. It may last longer than we want. It may never go away. But it is a healing process, right? And I point out that it's not just emotional in nature, right? It has cognitive effects, behavioral effects, right? Um, also, physical effects we know about a little bit more, right? Headaches, anxiety, things like that. Sometimes we don't think it also has a spiritual dimension, right? How many people remember asking early on, or maybe not asking, but thinking, oh, why me? Why my family? Why my child? This isn't fair. Damn it. It isn't, you know? And that points to the spiritual distress that we can experience as families. All part of the natural grieving process. Grief can be challenging because the feelings are really intense when they're hitting, right? They bring us to tears. They drop us to our knees sometimes. They remind us that life isn't fierce. And they remind other people too. And we remind other people and our children remind other people that life isn't fair. Our society is a grief avoidant one. We don't know how to deal with grief, right? Three day bereavement for a death and you're done. Well, guess what? Our experience is lifelong. We're not done, right? We're caring for our children as long as they're with us and caring for them after too in different ways. So that leaves parents facing a lot of isolation. Sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes we lose friends or relatives don't know how to interact with us because they're either walking on thin, you know, they're concerned that they don't want to say the wrong thing or they don't know what to do. They want to help, don't know how to help, things like that, right? So it is, it can be an isolating experience. It also places unique stresses on the family, on the marriage, on individuals, on the siblings. We're not always on the same page emotionally. We're experiencing different things in our daily life and different reactions to all those things that we're adjusting to. So grief does have a lot of challenges. There are a lot of different theories about grief and I'm not gonna go into all of those. I think the ones that we're most familiar with is Kubler-Ross's stages or I'll call them states, right? Denial, bargaining, anger. People usually have had some exposure to that. Um, here, I wanna point out that those states actually serve a purpose. Did you know that? Excuse me. <laughs> it's not just, uh, They're not just there to confuse us and make our days a little bit more challenging. No, they actually serve a purpose. Denial, or more often we see this as minimization, right? That helps buy us, buy us time to deal with the challenges we're facing, you know? Just keeps it at a distance a little longer so we can pull it together before we're ready to deal with it. Bargaining points out an attempt to control. We have so much uncertainty in our life. And part of our healing is about controlling, learning to control those things you can. But bargaining points out that it is, you know, we are attempting to control. Sadness actually helps us put in perspective the challenges we're facing and the meaning of different things in our life, the meaning, what it means to be a parent, what it means to, you know, work together as a family, helps us um, explore some of those spiritual issues that we may not have gotten to otherwise. Anxiety, yeah, even that has a purpose, right? It motivates us to define an issue for ourselves, like, oh God, this is really bothering me. And so we spend time figuring it out, right? It also is great for giving us the motivation to make change. You know, it kind of propels us. It gives us that momentum we need. So does the anger sometimes. <laughs> Gotta be careful with that one. And guilt isn't typically included in part of the stages, but I include it here because it does help us like define issues of cause and responsibility, except the reality that we can't, no matter how much we want to, protect our children from everything, right? They need medical procedures. They need to limit their sports. 
there's a lot of vulnerability and a lot of challenge and a lot of guilt in being a parent. So why do I tell you this? I don't want to overwhelm you. No, I want you to recognize that these, this is a normal, these are normal experiences for families, right? We have a very complex, unique situation. I want you guys to give yourself credit. You know, we're dealing with a lot on a daily basis. I want you to have realistic expectations of yourself, right? Iris's mom talked about self-compassion and self-care yesterday. We're going to touch on that a bit more. Um, I want to help reduce what we consider sometimes negative feelings, that guilt, that, you know, feeling bad about the anger, about the sadness, the fact that you're having a bad day. That's why I tell you this. But I also bring good news. Parenting our kids also brings rewards, much like, you know, we heard from that mom at the beginning. And there are ways to take care of yourself throughout this journey. So some of the rewards include adjustment and appreciation, right? We learn to kind of accept the situation. If you had told me 32 years ago, I'd accept the fact that my daughter had Rett syndrome, I would have laughed you out of the room. I know how absurd it might sound to some of you, but the reality is time went by. I did learn to cope better and I did come to an appreciation and yes, an acceptance of her disabilities. You know, what I've done with that experience is different than what you might do with that experience, but it is possible. Um, and I don't want you to think of acceptance as like the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. It's not just that. It's, you know, um, returning to, a, it's not a new, it's not an old way of functioning. It's not the old normal, but finding a new normal, finding a baseline for your family, for yourself, as you adjust to all the challenges that being a parent can bring. So what does this look like? We heard from one parent before. Here's another mom. She said, it has been a remarkable journey so far. There was so much grieving at the beginning. Questions of why, why me? The loss of a typical childhood, loss of milestones to come. But then the reality of acceptance pops up when you least expect it. And you learn to live fully within the moments of each day, to celebrate the smallest of victories. The perspective is life-changing and the most precious gift. I hope to use these gifts for the rest of my life. I bet if I talked to a few of you parents out there, I'd hear similar thoughts and expressions. So what are some of the rewards? Personal growth, you know? More comfortable with advocating, with change, getting good at adapting, not just to the circumstances with our kids, but life in general, right? Um, taking advantage of the moments that arise, redefining priorities. You know, not everybody goes through life conscious of what their choices mean or making conscious choices to direct their life. When you have so little time and it's, there's so much to do in a day, you make really conscious choices about where you're going to spend your energy. And that can be a blessing. You know, I bet you'll find new friends, not just here in this room, but other places as you go about your child's journey and your journey as a family. Um, I think one of the things I hear echoed most often is that families are more compassionate with others, right? They're less judgmental. They know how difficult it is at some points and they're more likely to cut their friends and other people in their lives a little bit of slack, right? Because they want the same in return. And you'll discover strengths and build resiliency, capacity to love that you never thought possible. <laughs> you know, lot of growth with being a parent. But how do you get there? What does it even mean to cope? Lots of different de definitions out there. Some people say it's to, you know, coping is to deal with and attempt to overcome difficulties. Others say to reduce the negative emotions and conflict caused by stress. The one I like best is the last one, the use of cognitive and behavioral strategies to manage the demands of a taxing situation. But I'll add not just cognitive and behavioral, but emotional, social, spiritual aspects as well. Just like grief affects us in all these ways, we need to use coping skills and 
kind of all these areas to be the best we can be and to be there effectively for our children and our families. So that's still kind of pretty generic and vague. So how do you cope in the midst of, yeah, you know, one of those moments? <laughs> Here's some strategies that, that tend to work. Stay in the present moment, right? Don't start catastrophizing about the future. Oh my God, I will never get out of this house. You know what? You will, you know? So st stay in the present moment. Don't go back to the, the past about, oh my God, you know, this is going to be the same thing as last time. Is it normal to have that reaction? Yeah, but that doesn't mean you have to stay with it. You're like, okay, I know what I'm doing. I recognize this. I don't need to go there. I'm just going to stay here. What do I need to do now, right? Use self-regulation techniques, right? The old fashioned count to 10, count to 20, count to 100 if you need to before you react. Discharge energy. We heard how exercise and walking is so important. Take a walk, you know, regain your equilibrium before you, if you have the time to deal with whatever is presents in the moment. You don't always, and I recognize that, but sometimes you do, especially if you're dealing with your partner. <laughs> you can take a time out for mommy's health or daddy's health right? Um, recognize that you are not your feelings, right? Feelings are emotions, energy and emotions. They pass. And so will these, whatever you're feeling, chances are you're not going to be in the same place tomorrow. And recognizing that sometimes just gives you that little bit of space you need to cope with what's happening now. And similarly, separate your child from the situation, right? Recognize that your child is not his or her behaviors or his or her disease. He's not doing this. She's not doing this on purpose. You know, sometimes it just stinks having to deal with this. But it's not their fault, you know? And I think sometimes it's hard to remember that on a bad day. But those are some strategies you can um, use in the midst of emotion. What about tools for the long haul? Number one, many of us probably have already learned that. Let go of perfectionism. You know, sometimes we feel so bad for our kids. We want to do everything perfect and be, you know, craft their whole world to prevent obstacles and barriers and um, be everything to that person, mother, father, grand, you know, whatever. That is a recipe for disaster so often. We are limited. Humans by nature are limited, right? recognize your strengths, your weaknesses, you know, and work with those, right? Don't beat yourself up for not being perfect. I don't know anybody who is perfect. Be compassionate, gentle with yourself and others. Again, don't beat yourself up, right? Use positive self-talk if you need to. Acknowledge your strengths. Strive to understand your partner's experience. Be compassionate with them as well. Practice that self-care everybody's talking about, you know? And I don't just mean taking a bath or having a massage. Those are awesome. Do those if you can. But don't forget to do the simple things. Practice gratitude. There's some wisdom in the old, you know, wives' tales about stopping to smell the roses, you know? Notice what brings you joy. If it's roses, if it's something else, if it's taking that hike, what makes your soul sing? Whatever it is, do more of that. That's real self-care, you know? It just can't be something for the moment. It's something that's restorative to your soul, fulfilling for you. I used to think it was chocolate. It's not. <laughs> <laughs> so what else? Carve out time to have fun. Make positive memories with your partner, child, other children. One of the best things we did, and we were so blessed at the time, um, we lived in California and they had a wonderful out of home um, respite facility. When I first heard of it, I'm like, yeah, ain't no way. I'm leaving Katie with some stranger. <laughs> well, guess what? You know, after a couple months of a number of challenges, I'm like, well, we can give it a try. You know, let's see. So we scheduled a weekend and uh, dropped her off. Went back 20 minutes later to check on her, make sure she wasn't being neglected, you know, followed up the next morning for the same thing. But we got the first night's sleep, full night's sleep that we'd had in years, 
you know, and we got time to spend with Katie's sibling, Alyssa, and do things that she could do, but Katie couldn't. Did we miss Katie? Yes. But it was it making those memories I wouldn't trade for anything. And guess what? Katie was happy and fun when we came to pick her up. They had done some wonderful activities with her. So like I said, we were really blessed. That doesn't exist everywhere. But take advantage of the opportunities for respite you do get. Let grandma babysit one time or you know, once a month, even if that's a possibility, or find a nurse who you can find a way to pay to do it for you. Making those positive memories to kind of offset some of the challenges we go through is really important. And it'll serve you well as an individual, as a couple and a family. And make appropriate use of the resources, right? If you've got somebody like, Jessica, a care coordinator you can contact or um, complex care um, people at the hospital. If there are you know, community agencies that provide services that could benefit your child, adapted PE, whatever it is, use those resources. You don't have to do it all. Yeah, you probably have to coordinate it all, but you don't have to do every little thing. So use those resources. And one of the best resources in addition to care coordination, palliative care services. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Jess Kennan, the nurse practitioner at PD Pals to tell you more about palliative care. Mm -hmm. 